Yo, what's good everyone? Welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about blockchain and cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is really big right now, especially with Facebook's announcement of their new cryptocurrency called Libra, so I decided to look more into it. What I found was that there's literally thousands of different types of cryptocurrencies on the market right now, so I thought if there's so many different versions, I might be able to make my own. So sit back, relax, and let's make our own cryptocurrency. To be able to make a new cryptocurrency, we're going to have to understand what it is. The most important thing that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin use is blockchain. Here's a brief explanation. So a block is just a collection of data, and a blockchain is a chain of these blocks. Let's take a closer look. A block contains information, including what's called a hash. A hash is a unique identifier, kind of like a person's name. It's important to understand that this hash depends on all the block's other data. So if you change something in the block, its hash will change too. Like, let's say you have a friend named Michael. If Michael's hella skinny, you know him as Skinny Michael. But if Michael hits the gym and gets super ripped, now you know him as Big Michael. Because the qualities of Michael changed, so did his name. A block also contains the hash of the previous block on the chain, as well as other information like transaction data. So because all the blocks contain their own hash and the hash of the previous block, they're connected in a chain. You can think of this like people standing in a line. Each person has their own name, and let's say each person knows the name of the person standing behind them in line, as well as other information such as the weight of their own left nut. Because each person knows the name of the person before them and have their own name, we could gather all these people and form the same line every time. Once data is added to a blockchain, it's ideally what we call immutable. Pretty much this means that once we add data, it's stored and almost impossible to change it. But how does it do this? To do this, blockchain relies on some shit called decentralization. Decentralization means that it doesn't rely on any central service, but instead relies on a peer-to-peer -peer network. An example of a centralized system is a bank. It's centralized because the bank stores your money as well as all the transactions in its own database, which they verify independently. You trust the bank with your money. But with a decentralized system, such as a peer-to-peer -peer network, responsibilities of storing and verifying data is distributed amongst the people. Regarding blockchain, everybody in this peer-to-peer -peer network, which is open to anyone, has a copy of the blockchain. This is what makes it what's called a distributed ledger. When a new block is added to the blockchain, each person verifies that it's okay to add it to the chain and adds it to their own version of the chain. If everything checks out and we have a majority of the network or over 50% that agrees on verifying this new block, then we have what is called consensus and the accepted blockchain is updated to include this new block. And if someone were to change data in the chain or add a block that had tampered data that gave them a million dollars, their version of the blockchain would be different than what's accepted by the majority in the network and this person would not be able to get this change onto the real accepted blockchain. This is like in the line of people, if Big Michael decides to lie and say that his left nut weighs 2 pounds instead of what it actually weighs, in a peer-to-peer -peer network, such as a network of millions of doctors that have his original left nut weight data, they all say no, it's 0.33 pounds. This is really important because if it was based on a centralized system, like one single trusted doctor that just kept a list of all the people in the line and the weight of their left nut, all Michael has to do is bribe this one doctor to write that his left nut is 2 pounds and then it would be verified and everybody would accept that his left nut is 2 pounds when it is actually 0.33 pounds. The last really important concept of blockchain is called proof of work. Say someone changed some data in their own version of the blockchain. They could do this, but before it even gets to the consensus verification, it would break their own version of the blockchain as the chain is no longer intact. This is because when they change the data in the block, its hash changes, so the block pointing to it no longer points to it, breaking the chain. So to fix the chain, this person could go through and change the hash value data for every block, and using computers and looping through the entire chain, this is actually not that difficult to do. So to protect against this by slowing down the process, a blockchain has a proof of work algorithm. There's technically an infinite amount of proof of work algorithms, but the simplest way for me to understand this was to think about it like this. 
Imagine there's three variables, x, y, and z. We're given z and don't know y, and have to find a value for x such that x times y equals z. To solve this, we should start by guessing any value for x, say 1. We multiply 1 times y, and the only feedback we get is if this value is equal or not equal to z. If it's not, then we should try another value like 2 and 3, and every number until we get that x times y equals z. Then once we have this value for x, we've solved this specific proof of work algorithm. This value for x is stored in our block and affects our hash, making it the correct one. This is just an example that's really basic and wouldn't actually be implemented because it's too fast to solve, but it has the same concept of brute forcing an answer or literally attempting every possible answer until you happen to get the right one. So proof of work algorithms make it really hard to override the entire blockchain because we would have to go through and solve this long proof of work algorithm for every single block in the chain. With this well implemented blockchain technology behind stuff like Bitcoin and Ethereum is really secure. However, if someone were to gain over 50% of the peer to peer network in order to verify some kind of corrupted data, they could crash the entire system. But because of properties of blockchain such as the proof of work algorithm, this is pretty much impossible to do. Okay, so now we're finally done with that. I hope it made sense, but um, now we can make the cryptocurrency. So we can pretty much use any object oriented programming language, but um, I'm going to use Python because it starts with a P and that's Rick Ross's favorite letter. Shout out to all the pair. We're going to start by making a blockchain object and this blockchain contains blocks. So we're going to make an object for that. And a block contains data, including transactions. So we're going to have a transaction object as well. And for the blockchain object, we're gonna have to initialize it to have a chain of blocks, which we're gonna store in an array. And for the block object, we need the hash, the hash of the previous block, as well as a list of the transactions, which we're also gonna store in an array. And we're also gonna be storing other information like the time the block was created, as well as the index of the block or the number of the block. For the transaction object, we're gonna have the basic stuff like a sender, a receiver, the transaction amount, the time the transaction was created, as well as its own hash. And for the hash of these blocks and transactions, we're gonna be using an algorithm called Shasha Madingalinga 256, which is the same algorithm that Bitcoin uses to store their hashes for their blocks. Then we need a function to add blocks to our blockchain, and we're going to test what we have so far with the test function that makes a new blockchain, adds three random blocks to it, and then prints it out. So as you can see here, it works because we have a blockchain that has three blocks, and each block has its own hash as well as the hash of the previous block, making them connected in a chain. So technically right now what we have is the most bare bones version of a blockchain. Okay, so now we're gonna have to implement a proof of work algorithm. And remember how I said the blocks hash depends on all the blocks other data? So pretty much we're gonna store a value in the block and this is gonna be like X in our example or the unknown. We're gonna call this variable nonce. And we're gonna brute force a solution for this variable until it makes the hash such that its first four digits are one, two, three, four. The process of solving for this value or nonce is called mining. And you probably heard this with like Bitcoin mining and shit like that. And for our cryptocurrency, we're going to pretty much do the same thing. We're going to have a list of pending transactions or transactions that are waiting to be added to the blockchain. And when someone mines a block, they're going to be adding a new block with all these transactions onto the blockchain. The person mining is going to be rewarded some value of our cryptocurrency. And this is pretty much how our whole system stays stable. Okay, so now we're gonna test this by adding a new transaction and mining a new block. When it's mining the block, it's gonna be incrementing our value nonce and checking to see if it makes the hash start with 1, 2, 3, 4. Right now, there's a delay on the output, but let's turn that off. So yeah, our computer solved the proof of work algorithm and it came up with if the nonce was equal to 61,601, then it would make the hash of the block start with 1234. And once we solve this, it adds the block to the blockchain storing the transaction. Now we're going to have to be able to verify that each of the transactions that we add to the blockchain is valid. And we're going to do this in the same way that people sign their checks in real life in order to make those checks valid. 
To do this, we're going to give each person their own set of unique keys, a public key and a private key. With these keys, each person will be able to sign each transaction they make in order to verify that it's valid. We're going to use a Python library called Cryptodome in order to generate these keys as well as sign transactions with the key. The cryptographic algorithm that we're going to be using to generate these keys is called Rivis Shitass 76, which is widely used for secure data transmission. So now when we add a transaction, we're going to be past the key of the sender and we're going to be using this key in order to sign the transaction. And we're going to test this in a test file that generates a new key for the sender and makes a new transaction. Let's see what happens. So it generated the keys and I printed out the public key and we get confirmation that our transaction was signed, making it valid. So yeah, it all looks good. Technically, now we have a cryptocurrency that's functional, but I'm going to make an interface so that we can see it work and so that people can actually use it. Alright guys, so I'm not going to lie, this was a huge fucking grind, but after a long time and a lot of work, we finally got the interface working. Um, the video is already getting kind of long, so I'm not going to go through the code, but if you do want me to, just leave a comment below and I'll probably just make another video in the future. In the meantime, let's just walk through the interface. So here we have the blockchain viewer, and right now we only have one block in the blockchain. This is the block that doesn't have the hash of the previous block, and this block is just empty. As you can see, there's no transactions in it, and this is called the genesis block. So if we want to make a transaction, it's not going to let us until we sign in. So let's just go there, and we don't have an account yet, so let's just fill this out. Now that we're signed in, let's see what information's in our account. In our account, we have our name, our username, our email, our public key that we generated when we created the account, as well as a balance. And I started out everybody having a balance of 100 just for testing purposes. Also, keep in mind that we didn't change anything in the backend that we did before. This interface is just a nicer way of looking at all the data. Okay, so all our account information looks good, so let's go to the mining page. In the mining page, we can see our pending transactions, and there's already some pending transactions that I made before, but let's add to this list by making a transaction. Here we can make a transaction like we did before, and we have the same data like a sender, a receiver, and the amount. And as you can see, our sender box is locked and auto-filled with our own account because we should only be able to send money from our own account. So let's fill this out and make a transaction. And now we can see that the transaction that we just made is added to our list of pending transactions. So now let's go ahead and mine this block and it's going to take a second but once it's done, we're going to see that our minor reward that goes to us for mining this block is added to the pending transactions. This means that we're going to get the reward once the next block is mined. And if we go back to the blockchain viewer, we can see that the block that we just mined is added to our blockchain and includes all the transactions. Then if we go back to our own account information, we can see that our balance is now 80 instead of 100 because of the 20 that we just transferred to another account. This is just a way for us to interact with our cryptocurrency, but our cryptocurrency is still missing the most important thing about blockchain technology, which is decentralization. To make it decentralized, we're gonna have to make a peer-to-peer -peer network. We're gonna do this by registering each system that uses our cryptocurrency as a node. This pretty much means that all the systems that use our cryptocurrency are added to the peer-to-peer -peer network and can see each other's blockchain. And for the consensus verification, because we already have all the validation shit in place, we're just gonna keep it simple and say that the longest blockchain in the peer-to-peer -peer network should be the correct one. So if the majority of the peer-to-peer -peer network agrees with this new longest blockchain, they're all gonna adopt this and set their own blockchain to this new longest block. Now, theoretically, if someone were to mine a block, the block would be added on everybody's blockchain. To test this, we're gonna run our interface on two separate addresses, and this is gonna emulate how it would be if two separate people ran our interface on two different physical devices. So now we just sign in on two different accounts and... Fuck. So, turns out I just had a typo, so let's run it and sign in again. Now that we're signed into two separate accounts on two different nodes, we're gonna add a couple of transactions on one of them, and once it's added to our list of pending transactions, we're gonna mine the block. 
And when we mine a block, it gets added to our blockchain. This isn't anything different than what we saw before, but now on our other system, when we reload the page, that blockchain gets updated as well. Okay, but this consensus verification has to work for any node in this peer-to-peer -peer network, so we're gonna try it the other way. We're gonna add some transactions to this other node, and when we have it in the pending transactions, we're gonna mine a new block and see what happens. So the block that we just mined is now added to the blockchain on this node. This isn't anything new. But now, if we refresh the other node, we can see that its blockchain is updated to include this new block as well. Also, if we were to look into the blockchains of each of these nodes, we would see that all the data inside these blockchains are the same, which is what we want. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up our video because our cryptocurrency is functional, but the only thing is that our cryptocurrency has no value. So I was thinking that I would give this cryptocurrency some value by tying it to some kind of gym membership thing, like they could use it for a gym membership, but this idea is actually already being developed and I think it's really cool. But yeah, that's pretty much the end of the video. Like always, I'm going to post all the code on GitHub, uh, the link will be in the description. And yeah, if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like the video, all that. Um, Alright guys, have a great day. Please check out some of my other videos if you have time and I'll see you in the next video.